Would you pray with me? O oh God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O oh God, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Please be seated. Throughout this year in church, we're doing a year-long treatment of Christian theology. Each month presenting a foundational idea that makes the Christian faith what it is rather than some other faith, differently constituted, differently understood. In December, that is in Advent, we were expounding on the idea of God incarnate. What does it mean for our God to be one who takes on human flesh? In January, that is the season of Epiphany, we were expounding on what is human nature, what do we understand ourselves to be in the Christian faith. And in the season of Lent, we are going to be diving deeply into the concept of sin. Each week we are going to be exploring a different part of the meaning and manifestation of sin, the role that it plays in the Christian faith as an idea sinning against others, being sinned against, the way that sin can echo down through the generations, how sin can become communal or systematized, organized. Now I can see you all reaching for your calendars right now. Note to self, next four weeks, skip church. <laughs> sin is difficult to talk about. It is not so much that the word has baggage, it is that the, world, the word itself is entirely baggage. And as a Christian who holds to an expansive and grace-filled understanding of the faith, sin and speaking about it simply is not central to my teaching of the faith. And yet, I put to you that sin, as it is laid out in the Bible, as Paul has talked about it here in Romans 7, Sin, as it's laid out in the Bible, I need this conception in order to understand myself, in order to understand the world. There is even, I think, good news for us within the concept of sin itself. Now, to begin, sin, fundamentally, has to do with the idea of morality. And I am on board with the idea of trying and striving to live a moral life. This is a good thing. And if morality, the word, has a positive value, then the corresponding negative integer, the word for not being moral, is sin. Sin has fundamentally to do with morality and the world. The world is a morally complex place. I am able to fall short and miss the mark and fail morally in innumerable ways. I wake up and I go to pour myself a cup of coffee and you know, I drink kind of a lot of coffee. Maybe I should cut back. You know, my body is a temple of glory to the God. No, maybe I should cut back on this coffee and oh gosh, this is not the free trade stuff. This is not the free trade stuff. I was in a hurry. This fair trade coffee that I should be buying, I was in a hurry. I just got this from the CVS. I will do better next time. Coffee in hand. I make breakfast and I reach for the eggs and oh, these are not the cage-free eggs. These are the factory farmed eggs, which is not great for the chickens. Where did I even get these eggs? That's right, from that same CVS. Why was I doing my shopping at CVS? That's right, I was working too late that day. I had been working too much. Boundaries, I've gotta do better about boundaries, gotta do better about my work-life balance. And oh gosh, is that a disposable fork? And it is black plastic. You can't even recycle that. And did I just burn the eggs? Now I can't throw this out. I can't throw this out and start my day all over because then on top of everything else would be wastefulness. Before breakfast. <laughs> it is easy for me to fail my own health, to fail world economic justice, to fail to protect innocent animals, to fail to protect the earth, to participate in exploiting those on the margins of the economy, it is quite a morally suspect breakfast. <laughs> this brings us to Paul's letter to the Romans. Chapter 7 of his letter to the church in Rome, Paul is laying out 
the relationship between sin and God's moral law. And Paul is arguing that God's moral law is impossible to follow. That's what he's arguing. It is impossible to follow the law. Paul clearly states that the moral law of God is a good thing, that it is simply correct. He should be following it, Paul says, that he should be following it. He should live a moral life. He simply is not able to. Not that he fails to do it, that if he tried harder, he could do it, that he cannot do it. Even knowing the good that he is trying to accomplish, he can't. With anguish, Paul says, I can will what is right, but I cannot do it, for I do not do the good that I want, but the evil I do not want is what I do. Now, if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I that do it, but sin that dwells within me. So I find it to be a law that when I want to do what is good, evil lies close at hand. This is the essence of sin as Paul presents it here. Sin is not some anodyne list of infractions, some set of places where you're not supposed to park. Sin is this kind of a, of a life force, almost. Sin is this thing that, that dwells within me. It's a life force that means that even when I try to do what is right, apparently especially when I try to do what is right, that my actions are turned from the good that I intended instead to the very evils I deplore. And what's worse, the very worst part about this whole thing is that this sin that he's talking about, this life force that is within me, sin, it is more powerful than me. It's more powerful than me. As Paul describes it in Romans 7, sin is like a, like a terrible beast that can pounce on me at any time, and I just cannot stop that from happening any, way, any more than a, a mouse can stop a cat from pouncing on it. Sin is just more powerful than my own will. Who will rescue me from this body of death? Paul cries out. Now we've returned to my morally suspect breakfast. I cannot even eat a meal without being tangled up in systems and circles and cycles of oppression and violence. If I can't even do that, then perhaps I'll never live a moral life, not perfectly. And Paul would say, that's right, John. That's right. Cannot live a moral life, not perfectly. The world is morally complex, and the ways that I can fail to live a morally upright life are innumerable, and it is not only a likelihood that I will sin and fall short, it is a certainty, and by accepting deep down that I will fail, and that there is no escape from that, by accepting that there is freedom. There is freedom by accepting that the power of sin is simply greater than my own power. There is freedom because I do not need to be bound by shame for failing or live in fear of failing. Failing and falling short is a certainty, so what help is it to be afraid? What reason is there for shame? Is not the knowledge that I have fallen short? It is not. It is not the knowledge that I have fallen short that causes misery. It is the illusion that I can be perfect that spawns misery. This fundamental insight about human limitedness, our vulnerability to powers greater than ourselves, this fundamental insight about human limitedness, it appears all over the place. This is the insight in the first step of recovery groups that alcohol can overpower the will, and so a greater power is needed. This is also the first noble truth of Buddhism, that suffering is inextricable from human life, and when avoidance is abandoned, then enlightenment can follow. This is Immanuel Kant's analysis of the dynamically sublime, that by encountering the vastness of the universe, human limits become the material of transcendence. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Remember, you are dust, 
and to dust you shall return. This fundamental insight, it appears all over the place. I am deeply, unchangeably, irredeemably, gloriously limited, imperfect. And holding myself up to a mirror and seeing only what is imperfect in order to chase perfection, that is a road that leads to the twin gates of shame and self-deceit. But to honestly understand and accept deep down that I am limited, this is a path to freedom from fear. What do I have to, to fear from the specter of moral failure? I may as well be afraid of the sunrise because both are a certainty. What have I to be ashamed of from the idea that I am not perfect? I may as well be ashamed that I'm not a hundred feet tall. You do not have to be perfect. You do not have to be perfect in order to be beloved by God. There is no place where earth's sorrows are more felt than up in heaven. There is no place where earth's failings have such kindly judgment given, as we'll hear. You do not have to be perfect. In order to be beloved by your neighbors and your friends and your fellow Christians, you do not have to be perfect in order to be a member of the church. You do not have to be perfect in order to be the pastor of a church. For there is not one of us, no, not one. There is not one of us who is living a perfect life that somehow eludes you. Love God. Love your neighbor. Love yourself. On this hangs all the law and the prophets. To understand deep down, deep down, that I am not perfect and cannot be. To embrace this first, this is the path to freedom, to living a good, if not perfect, life. Thanks be to God.